Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the 2016 All Bugs Getting Bad webinar series. We've had a really great schedule lined up this year, and today's presenter will not disappoint. Before we introduce the speaker, just a couple of things. If you look to the right of the presentation, you're going to see a chat box. Uh, we encourage you to type your questions into the chat box. They may be answered by moderators during the webinar, or they may be asked at the end of this presentation. And at the end of the webinar, there will be a few questions as well as a link to a follow-up survey. If you could please find the time to take the quick survey, it will really help us to continue and improve these webinar series for you. And a quick thank you now to the following e-extension communities of practice for bringing these webinars to you. Imported Fire Ants, Urban IPM, Alabama Cooperative Extension System, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, Clipson Cooperative Extension, and the University of Georgia Center for Urban Agriculture. Now today I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Hannah Barak. She is Associate Professor of Entomology and Extension Spe Specialist at North Carolina State University, and today she will familiarize everyone with spotted wing Drosophila basics for home growers. Um, it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you very much, Danny and Bethany, for the invitation to present today. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing some information with the group and answering any questions that you guys have. Um, as indicated, what we're going to be covering is some basics relative to spotted wing Drosophila um, and geared toward home growers. Um, we do a lot of work on spotted wing Drosophila with a lot of collaborators. You can see all the universities illustrated in the lower right-hand corner that we work with. Um, and so if you have questions that are a bit outside this general topic, do feel free to ask them when we get to the end, and we can deal with those as well. So my goal for today is that you will walk away from this webinar um, with a basic understanding of how to identify spotted wing Drosophila and know what you're looking at and if it is a problem. Um, some basics about spotted wing Drosophila biology and the significance of the pest. Some information about spotted wing Drosophila crop and non-crop hosts, so what do they eat and what can they negatively impact. When those hosts are susceptible to spotted wing Drosophila infestation, and if you have a susceptible host, what you can do to manage that potential damage. And you're going to see me use both in the slides and when I'm speaking, spotted wing Drosophila, FWD, and Drosophila suzukii, which is the scientific name of the insect, somewhat interchangeably. So you're going to hear those terms used um, all relative throughout this particular webinar. In addition to the information that I present here today, you can also find a lot more information um, from NC State on spotted wing Drosophila and the crops that it is impacting at some of our extension information portals for strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. And then also we have work at the, uh, or we have um, information we put together through the Southern Region Integrated Pest Management Guides for Small Fruit Crops. And you can find all of those at smallfruits.org. Those are geared toward commercial growers, but they have some useful information about what pests are present in these crops and how they can be managed, um, at least in a, in a commercial setting. Um, and some of that information is readily adaptable to home growers as well. All right. So first, let's talk a little bit about what spotted wing Drosophila is, um, or more commonly, the question that I tend to get from home growers, why are there worms in my berries? Um, this is usually the first question that um, a homeowner will ask me when I initially start having a conversation with them about spotted wing Drosophila. And so spotted wing Drosophila is an invasive, meaning it's a non-native fly whose larvae feed on soft-skinned fruit. And that's the problem. They are, the larvae are present in fruit. And I'll show you some images of that. So as their name suggests, spotted wing Drosophila males have spots on the end of their wings, one spot on each wing. The females lack those spots, but that's actually the sex that we're most concerned about when it comes to damage. Females lay their eggs under the surface of 
otherwise undamaged blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, cherries, strawberries, and some grapes. The larvae that hatch from those eggs develop internally inside the fruit, and those larvae can potentially be present at the time of harvest. And that's where the issue from a management standpoint arises. Larvae and fruit are, understandably, not something folks want to consume. Um, the pupae of this fly are usually found on, near, or inside the fruit itself. But by the time those flies pupate, the fruit is pretty damaged. So most likely, what you're going to see are larvae present in fruit and not going to see the pupae because by the time there's a pupa in there, that's not a fruit you would be interested in picking. This whole generation time from adult to adult takes about 10 to 15 days. That's going to depend on temperature and what time of year. The adults live for at least a month, sometimes longer, and they don't have a known diapause. Diapause is what we call hibernation in insects. So unlike some insects that go into um, a period of inactivity during the winter, these flies don't appear to do that. They continue to turn generations multiple times. That means that they can have lots and lots of generations in a calendar year. Um, so in some cases, perhaps up to 16 generations per year. This is a little bit of a timeline of the Fuddling Drosophila invasion in the United States and the rest of the world. They first showed up, or they were first observed, in California raspberries in late 2008. It took a while for those samples to be identified as a non-native fly, a spotted wing drosophila. So in early 2009, they were confirmed to be spotted wing drosophila. And it was confirmed that this insect was now present in the continental US. Following that initial detection in 2008, they were detected in Oregon, Washington, and Florida, and throughout Western Canada by late 2009. In 2010, they were detected in a number of other states, including places throughout the South East and the upper Midwest and in eastern Canada. In 2011, there were new detections in New England and the Mid-Atlantic states. And in 2012, they were detected throughout the rest of the Midwest. Before this fly was found in California, it was known as a pest really only in Japan from 1916 in cherries, primarily. It had been detected in Hawaii in the 1980s. But in the places where the fly was found, there weren't a lot of susceptible host crops grown, so it wasn't causing pest problems there. Simultaneous to all of these detections in the United States, it was also detected throughout Europe from 2008 to 2013, and it's been detected in Brazil in 2013. So it's not just our problem. It's a global problem that has spread really rapidly in the last eight years. It's, it's pretty remarkable the amount of spread that this insect has undergone. And this is just a map illustrating a timeline of those detections in the continental US from 2008 to 2013. And you can just kind of see the rapidity of the spread of this insect throughout the country. And this is mirrored in the other parts of the world that spotted wing drosophila has been spreading to as well. So here's just a few images that help you see those diagnostic characteristics I mentioned a little bit clearer. So you have the male on the left with the spots on the ends of both wings. The males also have two bands at the base of their front legs, two black bands. Those are called sex combs. Um, and they're called that because they are they're little comb-like structures that only males of Drosophila have. As I said previously, the females lack those spots. And as this image on the right illustrates, they're a little bit larger than the males. Um, and females look an awful lot like our native Drosophila species. And as Dr. Davis pointed out in the chat box, Drosophila melanogaster is a really common model insect that's used in a lot of different research, including genetics classes and biology labs. And the female spotted wing Drosophila look an awful lot like Drosophila melanogaster. Where they differ is in this little inset here. They have a highly serrated knife-like egg-laying device, or ovipositor is what we call it as entomologists. Drosophila larvae shown down on the lower right, or sorry, the lower left, um, can really not be distinguished from each other to species when they're in that larval stage. So Drosophila species all kind of look the same as larvae. 
Bottomly Drosophila pupae can be distinguished from other Drosophila pupae in that they have these little star-shaped breathing um, filaments on the what on the right hand side of that image there. So you see those little kind of starfish shaped ends on the right hand side of that pupa. Um, and those are distinctive to spotted wing drosophila. As I said previously, drosophila larvae cannot be visually distinguished um, from by species. Um, but spotted wing drosophila, unlike virtually all other drosophila species, infest otherwise undamaged fruit. Almost all other Drosophila species infest fruit that has already been damaged by something else and is starting to rot. Most other Drosophila species eat fungus, not fruit. So they're actually eating the fungus that's growing on that rotting fruit, not the fruit itself. Spotted wing Drosophila eats the fruit itself. So therefore, if you are looking at an otherwise undamaged fruit and you tear it open and find Drosophila larvae present, it's a very good chance that what you're looking at are spotted wing drosophila. Because some of the characteristics that I mentioned require some magnification, it can be a little bit tricky to identify them with the naked eye. And none of the traps or baits or lures that you might, have, might hear at, about out there for spotted wing drosophila adults are selective to species. And what that means is you're going to catch other Drosophila species in an adult spotted wing Drosophila trap. Even if it's marketed for spotted wing Drosophila, you will catch other species in there. So if you're going to use something like an adult trap, you need to be prepared to identify the flies that you're trapping. And so keep those diagnostic characteristics in mind. And this is just um, a tool that I found online that I really like. Um, so this website in here uh, shows you how you can turn your smartphone into a microscope to obtain that magnification necessary to identify those flies to species. There are lots of other hacks out there about how to turn your smartphone or a hand lens into a more um, usable microscope. But that's, this is one particular instruction guide I like um, for a strategy to give you that additional magnification need. And so again, your male, you're going to look at those wing spots and those bands on the front leg. And for the females, you're going to look at that heavily serrated ovipositor. That's the image up on the top of this set of images. And then you have these other Drosophila species shown in the middle left, the middle right, and the bottom right as compared to the lower, right, lower left spotted wing Drosophila. And you can just see relative to some of our native spotted wing Drosophila that large, differently shaped ovipositor there. So once you have that search image in place, it's not that difficult to tell female apart from other fly species, but you need to kind of be aware of what characteristics you're looking for. And I noticed, you know, from Clemson, folks mentioned the Powell Smith and, and Susan picked through tons of other species of flies in their spotted of traps, and that is exactly right. Um, that is one of the challenges right now. We don't have a lure that is selective spotted wing drosophila that we can use in traps. Um, so you do need to be aware of what is not a spotted wing drosophila as well as what is a spotted wing drosophila if you are using adult traps to determine if they're present in your area. Um, in addition to adult trapping, another strategy that we really encourage folks to use is to directly sample their fruit. So trapping adult flies tells you if adult flies are present in your general area. So that's a potential infestation. And fruit sampling tells you if you have an actual infestation. So our recommended fruit sampling method is doing what's called a salt test. And that's a generally quick way to assess larval presence. You use a salt water solution poured over a thin layer of fruit. And then you soak that fruit for 15 minutes. And we have an example of what that looks like at our YouTube channel here, which you can find through this link. And again, remember, when you're looking at fruit samples, you're looking at Drosophila larvae, which means that you can't necessarily distinguish those larvae to species. And so if you're going to sample fruit, you should not sample fruit that is already rotting and damaged because other Drosophila species might be present. So salt might also miss small larvae only because they can be very small when they're newly hatched. Um, but then we get into the somewhat academic discussion of, well, if it's a very, very tiny larvae and you can't see it, how much of a problem do you consider it to be? 
And I will let all of you answer that question for yourself. If you do a salt test and you see larvae in fruit, it's also useful to be able to distinguish spotted wing drosophila larvae from other larvae that you might find in those same fruits. And so the next three images are going to be candidate larvae that you might find in fruit at the same time as spotted wing drosophila larvae. So in this image, these are things that you might find in strawberries. You see spotted wing drosophila larvae over on the far left. They are pointed on both ends. They have black mouth hooks visible on the front end. And I always tell people that the front end is the end that is falling away from you. And they do not have legs. So those are your diagnostic characteristics for Drosophila larvae generally. We also occasionally have corn earworm or other caterpillars present in strawberries. They have a distinct head. They have three legs in the front and many what we call pro legs, those squishy soft legs all along their back. And caterpillars found in strawberries when they are mature tend to be quite large. So they would be much bigger than spotted wing Drosophila. Newly catched caterpillars might be a similar size to a nearly mature spotted wing Drosophila larva. And then finally, in strawberries, you may also encounter sap beetles. Sap beetles are beetle larvae. They have a distinct head again. They have three legs in the front. And they are a similar size to spotted wing Drosophila larvae when fully mature, at least some of the sap beetle species may be. Um, but if it has legs, if it has a clearly distinct head, it is not spotted wing Drosophila. It is something else. In raspberries, you have the potential to have some of these same species present um, in the addition of raspberry fruitworm, which is another beetle larva and it's going to look very much like a sap beetle larva. And then in blueberries, you have another fly, at least in the eastern United States, that can often be present. Um, it is a true fruit fly larva. It's called the blueberry maggot fly. And the key difference between larvae found in blueberries um, and that blueberry maggot fly versus spotted wing drosophila are spotted wing drosophila is pointed on both ends, and the larvae of blueberry maggot fly are what we call carrot shaped. They are pointed on the front end, and then they are blunt on the rear end. And so you can see a blueberry maggot larva that's curled up over here on the right, and then an illustration of one that's stretched out here in the center. And again, you're only going to find blueberry maggot larvae potentially in blueberries. And the reason why it's so important to distinguish what larvae you have present in fruit, if you have larvae present, is because the management of each of these are going to be somewhat different. And you don't want to undergo aggressive management practices for spotted wing drosophila if you don't need to, if that's not the problem you're dealing with right now. One of the biggest challenges to spotted wing drosophila management, yes, you definitely, and I just noticed in the chat box, the blueberry maggot is, um, it's a very distinctive fly as an adult, and so you will definitely not confuse the adults with spotted wing. It's really only the larvae that are the concern. Um, so spotted wing Drosophila, larvae and fruit are the problem that we're dealing with. And the reason why this damage is so challenging is it is difficult to see when the fruit are on the plant. And so fruit can appear otherwise undamaged on plants but still have larvae present in them at the time of harvest. Um, there are limited tools from a chemical standpoint because the damage occurs in fruit that is about to be picked. And so we have restrictions on insecticides that can be used on fruit that is ready to be picked. There is zero tolerance for infestation in commercial markets. Um, and this is a really important thing to note. We get questions a lot about whether there are larvae in fruit um, and whether or not consumers should be concerned. And the answer is not in the fruit that you are buying because people who are selling fruit will not purchase it from growers if they detect infestation. This is a really challenging scenario for growers. It means that they have to maintain zero infestation to be able to sell their fruit, but it means for consumers that you are not at risk of finding infested fruit. Um, so growers are very, very concerned about damage because loss can be really significant. Um, that zero tolerance translates into marketers often reject entire shipments of fruit from a single grower if they find even one of a present because they are so concerned about consumer exposure. 
So I mentioned that there are limited chemical tools that are effective against spotted wing drosophila and can be used during the period in which infestation occurs. And the non-chemical tools we have available are either very expensive or not effective enough to allow growers to meet zero tolerance thresholds. Although they might not be effective enough for growers to meet those zero tolerance thresholds, they may still be useful in a home growing environment. So we're going to talk about some of those. Let's talk a little bit about host preference. Um, so this is just an image of some of the different hosts that spotted wing drosophila eat. And so they eat raspberries, strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, cherries, and occasionally grapes. And what I've done in this image is I've illustrated the relative preference of these different hosts by spotted wing drosophila based on the size of the fruit in this image. So if a fruit is big in this series of images, it means that they lay lots of eggs in it. If a fruit is smaller relative to the other images, it means they lay fewer eggs in it. What it boils down to is that if they have a choice, spotted wing drosophila tend to like raspberries more than all of the other hosts. Flies also develop faster, and they can tolerate higher numbers of larvae within a raspberry, meaning they can tolerate competition from other larvae than they can in other fruits. So not only do they like raspberries the best, they also do the best in raspberries as compared to other fruits. This is some data from Japan where the fly had been found for many, many years prior to it showing up in the United States. Um, some post screening work that was done in Japan in the 1930s. And they were they documented that spotted wing drosophila were able to infest undamaged silverberry, which is um, related to some of the species that we have here in the U.S., undamaged strawberries, undamaged raspberries, and undamaged persimmons. They were also able to infest plum, loquat, grape, Asian pear, and tomato that had been previously damaged, but they were not able to infest those fruit in the middle if they were not already damaged. And then finally, they weren't able to infest damaged or undamaged watermelon, cantaloupe, or pumpkin. And so, it gives a sense of some of the things that they're able to attack. And for these fruit in the middle, the plum, the loquat, the grape, the Asian pear, the tomato, if they're already damaged and the flies get in there, the flies are not the primary problem. It's more important to control the damage that occurred that allowed the flies to enter that fruit than it is important to manage the spotted wing drosophila. So that's a really key thing that we try to talk to both growers and homeowners about um, what is the problem that you need to manage to prevent that damage from occurring. And I have some information up here on grapes. Um, I apologize, it looks like the image got a little bit condensed when it was uploading here, but the take home message here is that while flies can attack grapes, they generally don't like them, so they lay relatively few eggs in grapes, even if they have no choice in the laboratory. Flies that develop in grapes don't do very well. They develop very slowly, and they tend to be puny. And then in the field, generally, we only find spotted wing drosophila larvae in grapes that have been otherwise damaged by either other insects, mechanical injury, birds, something else going on there. And a good indication of that is if we find other Drosophila species in that fruit, spotted wing Drosophila is probably not the primary problem because it means that something else could get in there too. So let's talk a little bit about infestation timing. So this graph here in the orange line is illustrating spotted wing Drosophila trap captures per week at a site in western North Carolina. And I want you to notice the axis on here. The axis goes all the way up to 1,000, which means that even though it looks like we're not catching anything at the very beginning of this graph, which in this case was in March 2011, we're catching a few flies at all of the points along there, just way less than 1,000. And so the variability isn't really obvious at the beginning of the graph. But you'll notice that once we hit July, we see this big explosion in fly captures and, and in fly population. I've overlaid on top of this graph the fruiting period for some of our key spotted wing drosophila hosts in North Carolina. The strawberries for us typically fruit April through the end of June. Blueberries fruit May through July. 
and blackberries usually for us come on toward July and continue all the way through first frost. And one thing I wanted to use this figure to point out is that we have flies present in our early season crops potentially, but they're at really low numbers and they may or may not be an obvious infestation. So that may not be visible to a, to a consumer or to a homeowner if they go out and look at that infestation. So it might be very, very few fruit total that are infested. But by the time we hit midsummer, our fly populations are really large. And any fruit that is out there and fruiting during that period is at higher risk of infestation. And that's one of the reasons we are really um, challenged when we grow blackberries and raspberries here in North Carolina, because they are not only a preferred host, but they also fruit at the time of year when our populations of flies are the highest. So there's an interaction between fly population, fruit preference, and infestation risk. And for those of you in other parts of the country, just think about that when you're thinking about when your fruit are growing. So your, whatever your early season crops tend to be, those often tend to be at lower risk than our later season crops. And that same pattern often holds for varieties as well. If you have early fruiting varieties, they may experience less damage to, due to spotted wing drosophila just by virtue of the fact that they are earlier fruiting. And don't worry about the take home um, or about the, the detail in this message, but this was a nice study that was done in Europe. And I pulled this figure because it's from an open access journal, FOSS1. And so the link to this journal is on this page. Um, and what it's listed here are a range of wild and cultivated plant species in Europe that were found to successfully host spotted wing drosophila and the time of year that they occurred. There's two big take homes here. One is that there are a lot of different host species that can, that can support spotted wing drosophila development, both, again, wild and cultivated species. At least one of these crops is present all year round in temperate Europe, which is climatically quite similar to parts of the United States. And then the other thing you'll notice is a lot of these host species are the same um, genus as our cultivated fruit crops. And so relative to things we grow um, on a cultivated basis are pretty good hosts for these things, for these flies out in the wild. Um, so this gives you a sense of what other things they might be eating. And it also gives you a really good sense that anything soft and sweet is generally pretty attractive to these flies. And so it's They've got a wide host range. They can eat lots of different things. Um, but in terms of our crop host, they prefer, again, those berry crops that we previously discussed. Um, these are some non-crop host plants specifically from a study that was done in Michigan. And again, I'm just putting this information up here to illustrate both the time periods of when these hosts are present, basically our entire growing season, and some of the different um, groups that those um, fruit belong to. And both on the European host slide and on this slide, you might have noticed um, Philotica americana, which is the American pokeweed. Um, that's a very common plant out in the landscape. And so that's one of the, the non-crop hosts that these guys can be found on fairly regularly. And in our lab, we did some work uh, on pokeweed specifically, trying to understand if having pokeweed in the environment made it any better or worse for a crop infestation risk scenario. Um, and so what Lauren Diefenbrock, who's a postdoc in my lab, did was rear flies out of pokeweed or rear flies out of blackberry, which was growing right next to pokeweed, and then at what the flies did once they emerged. Did they lay eggs in the host that they came from, or did they lay more eggs in an alternative host? And what this figure is illustrating is if you look host on the bottom. When the flies emerge blackberry, and that's that natal host of blackberry, they were equally likely to lay eggs in pokeweed or to lay eggs in blackberry. If you look on the right of that graph, flies emerging from pokeweed are far more likely to lay eggs in blackberry than they were to lay eggs in pokeweed again. And so what we think that is due to is the fact that flies don't do so well in pokeweed. It's not the greatest host for them. They um, develop more slowly. Fewer of them survive. And when they emerge, they are smaller. 
but those fewer, smaller flies that emerge are way more interested in laying eggs in blackberry than they are in laying eggs in pokeweed. And so it's important to consider that when you think about risk of a crop that might be fruiting at the same time as those pokeweed plants that are growing along the edge of a field. So just to summarize some of that crop host work. So the major crop hosts are blueberry, blackberry, cherry, raspberry, and strawberry. Less likely but possible crop hosts include things like grapes, peaches, persimmons, and figs. And a lot of the factors determining whether or not those, not, those other crop hosts are going to be impacted have to do with when they are fruiting during the year and how soft they are. So infestation risk begins once fruit starts to ripen. It's highest in ripe fruit, and it's affected by population size. We're going to talk about that on the next couple of slides. And that infestation risk in our early fruiting crops tends to be lower in our, than in our later fruiting crops. Talk about non-crop hosts a little bit. Again, we have a very wide non-crop host range. They very few things are they are incapable of hosting spotted wind drosophila. And again, that seems to be related to how soft that fruit is. How significant a non-crop host is is going to depend on the time of year when it's fruiting and also location. Uh, in that European study I showed you, they found that wild cherries were highly infested, so up to 80%. A similar study that was done in New York found a lower rate of infestation of wild cherries, only about 15%. And they attribute that to the fact that there were different types of non-crop growing at the same time in New York than there were at the same time in Europe. And so how attractive a host is going to be also depends on what else is going on around it. Let's drill down a little bit more on infestation timing. So we talked about what to eat. Now we're going to talk about when they eat. Um, this is some work a PhD student in my lab did, uh, Katie Swoboda caged fruit at different stages of ripeness in a field where we had lots and lots of flies around. So she went out and placed these cages on fruit after they reached these different ripeness stages to exclude any other flies from laying additional eggs. And so we assume that any eggs that were laid in that fruit were laid prior to that cage being put on. She then let that fruit develop naturally on the plant removed it once it was fully ripe, and took it back to the lab to determine infestation. What she found was that in unmanaged research planting, eggs and developing larvae were present in every ripeness stage of fruit. They showed up in the fruit as soon as the fruit started to change color. That's our graph here on the left. And they were highest in fully ripe fruit. But some, some eggs were laid and some flies developed in fruit that were caged when they were just blush and starting to change color. She completed the same project in a commercially in a commercially managed blackberry field the following year. She found much lower rates of overall infestation, much lower fly populations, and that the infestation was concentrated in the perfectly ripe fruit. So this is what we think is going on here. The potential for infestation begins when fruit changes color. So when that fruit starts to change color, the flies can potentially be infested and survive. When there are low populations of flies, as shown on here in the left, they prefer to lay eggs in ripe fruit. When the fly populations are high, we believe that although they prefer to lay eggs in ripe fruit, competition might be driving them to less ripe fruit when there are lots of other flies out there. And so to look at this, what Katie did was take these weekly infestation snapshots over time doing that same caging methodology or employing that same caging methodology. So on the top figure here are the mean number of spotted the average number of spotted wing males and females that she's catching per trap. And then on the graph at the bottom, are the average number of larvae per berry at the different ripeness stages. And what you can see is we see that big spike in population occurring, again, right around the beginning of July. That's a pretty consistent time point for us here in the southeast. 
And concurrent with that big spike in populations, we see an increase in fruit infestation in our lower graph, and we see our fruit infestation developing first in our ripe fruit, so that black line starts taking off before our red, purple, and green pink line. So we, we suspect what we are seeing there is that spillover effect from the ripe fruit into the less ripe fruit as fly populations increase. And so I see Vicky's comment in the chat box that basically when populations are high, flies will infest fruit of any ripeness stages. And that is correct. Um, the exception to that is we don't tend to see flies laying eggs in pea green fruit. Um, and the, the question Vicky asks is what is the life cycle in a, of an adult spotted winged esophagus? So the adults feed on protein and sugar sources out in the environment. Um, the adults other than laying eggs in fruit, do not cause any direct damage. Um, and that time, uh, the, um, the lifespan of an adult spotted winged esophila is at least a month, and it can often be longer than a month. And so what we tend to see are multiple overlapping generations. And that's why we see these big spikes in populations in the fall. We're seeing multiple generations of flies being captured at the same time. Did that answer your question? All right, um, so now let's, let's talk about management. We know what they're feeding on, we know when they're likely to feed on it, and now let's talk about some strategies that can be employed to manage spotted wing dysophila to reduce that potential damage. Um, so these are the four key points I encourage um, particularly home growers to consider relative to managing spotted wing dysophila. First, you need to reduce the likelihood of infestation by picking fruit frequently and completely. You want to minimize the time that a ripe fruit is exposed to those egg-laying flies that are flying out in the environment. So harvest as frequently as possible and as completely as possible. Don't leave fruit hanging on the plant if it's already ripe. If you're not going to consume it, get it off and destroy it. Once your fruit is picked, keep it as close as possible for as long as possible. Flies slow or stop developing at low range. And we'll talk, I'll show you a little bit of data about that as well. Um, it's possible to, possible to exclude flies to prevent egg laying, just like with little mesh bags that I showed you that we used for our research experiments. Um, there are some ways that flies can be excluded. There are some pros and cons um, for that exclusion component. Um, and then you can potentially use insecticides to manage spotted wing drosophila, but in a home context, I'm pretty reluctant to recommend insecticide-based management. So let's talk a little bit about cold storage. So this is some data um, that we did looking at post-harvest temperatures and whether or not different life stages of spotted wing drosophila will survive at those temperatures. Um, this is data where we infested raspberries with different Stages of spotted wing drosophila, eggs, newly hatched larvae, or first instars, middle-aged larvae, or second instars, and third instar larvae, which are fully grown. Those larvae were then, or those fruits that had been infested by larvae were then cold storage at 35 degrees Fahrenheit for 72 hours. Basic temperatures is the preliminary work that we did. And what you see is that the survival of eggs in our blue bars, as compared to eggs that were held in fruit at room temperature, was significantly reduced. So was survival of second instar larvae, and so was survival of third instar larvae. We repeated the same experiment in blueberries and saw a similar response. In eggs, we actually had no eggs surviving um, when they were held at 35 degrees Fahrenheit for 72 hours, and we had reduced survival in our nearly mature third and star larvae. We also measured how long it took for those insects to reach maturity in that fruit. And so in our blue bars on the top, we have 68 or room temperature blueberries, cold stored blueberries. And then in our red bars, we have room temperature raspberries and cold stored raspberries. And the take home message on this graph that there is a 72-hour or three-day difference in the height of these bars between room temperature 
and cold storage. Lives held in cold storage took three days longer to reach maturity if they survived than flies that were held at room temperature. And what that means is that when you have flies at whatever life stage they are at cold storage, for all intents and purposes, development is stopped. So just to put a little bit of context around that, at least some of the eggs on larvae died after three days at 35 degrees Fahrenheit, but not necessarily all. We did look at shorter time periods and different temperatures uh, in artificial diet, but we have not looked at them in fruit. And so we can't say a whole lot about different temperatures and different time periods in fruit specifically. But we're pretty comfortable saying that if a larva or an egg goes into cold storage tiny, it's likely going to come out tiny if it survives. Now I'll talk a little bit about exclusion. Um, you can go back and look at this image in greater detail in the recording, or this table in greater detail in the, in the recording. But the bottom line in this message, or this slide, um, is that fine mesh can prevent infestation by spotted wing drosophila larvae if that mesh is placed around planting for fruit. Um, it has, this is 0.98 millimeter insect netting with the netting that they used in this Japanese study, and they were able to preclude or prevent infestation in blueberries. Um, this work has been repeated in New York, and we actually have some commercial growers in New York who are implementing this exclusion netting strategy. A couple caveats to exclusion. First, it can be pretty costly, so the netting itself can be quite expensive. The structure to place that netting on is going to be costly. And netting is, exclusion is only going to work if the, if the barrier is maintained, meaning that if it's a crop where you have to enter frequently to pick, likely going to bring flies in with you when you enter. So I'm a little bit hesitant to recommend the cost associated with exclusion for growers who are growing things like strawberries, blackberries, and raspberries, which need to be picked very frequently, blueberries, which are typically picked on a weekly basis, are a little easier to manage, something like an exclusion strategy. But for a homeowner, exclusion is a really great option, and there are lots of different mesh containers that approximate this 0.98 millimeter section. And I noticed that, uh, <laughs> that someone had asked whether or not larvae will continue to grow after they've been eaten, and that is the exact correct answer. Um, larvae are not a threat if consumed. I will, this is Usually the point in a presentation when I say I've probably eaten thousands of these guys over the course of working on them, um, and I am just fine. Um, and here's just remember that, that bag we used in our experiments. And this is one way that you could make an exclusion bag for a home situation. These are little bags that we sewed. We also um, have recommended to growers to use paint strainers, uh, which are used in commercial uh, uh, aerosol-based paint sprayers. You can buy them at places like Lowe's and Home Depot, and that fine mesh paint strainer will also make a really great sleeve cage to put around your developing fruit. Um, so then, again, just a little bit more context for exclusion. You should protect those fruit before they're susceptible to damage. That means green, not changing color. And again, those barriers will only work if they remain in place once you remove those cages to pick or observe fruit flies can get in. And so the frequency with which you need to pick is a consideration. Finally, I've got a little slide here illustrating some of the different insecticides that are considered to be effective against spotted wing drosophila. These are summarized rankings that my colleague at Michigan State, Rufus Isaacs, put together. Um, these are trade names of different insecticides across the bottom and rankings from entomologists throughout the United States of those materials. The only reason I put them up there is to give you a sense of some of these different materials perspective, but the big caveat for growers in dealing with pesticides is you need to check the label you are using. If it's labeled in the crop that you intend to apply it to, if it's labeled for food usage, and what all the associated restrictions are with respect to harvest, reentry, and handling that plant once it's been treated. 
Um, so I see a question about whether or not blueberries can be soaked in water for one hour. Um, I, and that really depends on what your end use for that fruit is going to be. Um, so if you're going to use that fruit for processing, I wouldn't see a concern with soaking them in water. Um, but if you're going to fresh consume them, it's going to certainly shorten the shelf life of that fruit. All right. I'm going to revisit my goals for the webinar, which were to hopefully help you identify spotted wing drosophila, understand its basic biology and why it's significant, some of the crop and non-crop hosts to be potentially concerned about, when those crop and non-crop hosts are susceptible to infestation, and some basic management tactics. So hopefully I've done that, um, but let's open it up to any additional questions that you guys have. If anybody has questions, now would be a great time to um, type those into the chat box. I have a question. All right. Um, when you were, you showed the slide, it was a few slides back, where they were actually, it, it looked like they were netting individual fruit. Yeah, so that was um, our, oh, sorry. And get back to that slide. Um, with our research design, um, the intention for that was to exclude station by spotted wing drosophila from fruit that um, was at those different ripeness stages. And so, from that, the design for that was. Um, intended to look at whether or not an individual berry was infested and at what ripeness stage it was infested. Okay. Thank you. Guys, thank you all for, for answering these questions that have popped up. And we also have a really quick survey that the link will come up shortly that I, I wish you all would please participate in so we can continue these webinars. See, does anyone else have any more questions? And I reiterate Dr. Davis's comment and Vicki's comment about pesticides. Um, label is the law. Always read the label if you're going to use pesticides. Um, and it can be really tricky with um, commercial, or sorry, um, homeowner horticultural products uh, used on fruit crops. Those labels can be kind of tricky to interpret if you buy something at, say, Lowe's or Home Depot to really make sure that it's labeled for use on a food crop and not just labeled for use on ornamental planting. Um, and if you have any questions about it, definitely work with your cooperative extension folks. And that's, that's really important, too, because I was, I was just in one of the, the stores recently actually reading some of the labels just to get back up to date with them, and I noticed that, that some of the home fruits phrase, the label had actually changed from previous years. Yes. Label uh, changed frequently. The, and training changed frequently. Mm -hmm. So it's good to reevaluate what you're using each year as well and make sure it's still yeah, just because you would, Yeah, just because you would buy a, a brand name product one year, the product with the same name the following year is not necessarily going to be the same material. Let's see, can, I, can we go ahead and advance the slides to the, there it goes. So if you guys wouldn't mind if there's the link to the to the survey that we asked you to take. And if there's no more questions, Dr. Barack, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a, an awesome presentation, and I can't wait to use some of your tips in my own blueberry patch at the house. Um, you guys remember we won't be here in July, but we'll be back uh, Friday, August 5th with a webinar on controlling roaches before they control you.
a topic I'm, I'm sure we could all brush up on. So we'll see. And please don't and hesitate. Yeah, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me if you guys have any additional questions. Um, I'm happy to connect you guys with local resources or to deal with questions on, um, on our end, too. That's awesome, Will. Happy Friday, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. <laughs>